I have a question for the Cortre Triatum. No. Um, is the the uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous return part of the uh, the anatomy of the septal wall placement, or more in the actual development of the pulmonary veins and their return? Like, uh, is there a certain type of pavpar that, or whatever that is more associated with Cortre Triatum? I guess. No. It's off. So the question is, is which type of anomalous pulmonary venous return might be associated with with uh, core tritratum? And it's really both. It, they tend to be more of the partial type, and we don't know if it's truly a, a genetic relation or if it's just one of those things that's associated together. I, I think it's more the latter. It just kind of happens together. I don't know if there's a, a true gene or a common pathway, sort of like the Schoen syndrome, left-sided obstruction thing. So I would say it's sort of mixed, but it's mostly partial, partial veins. And there's a question by the gentleman in the middle. Uh, yes, that's loud, sorry. Um, I guess my question is for a, this is like uh, back to the VSD lecture we had earlier. Uh, for an outlet VSD, um, we could be worried about some uh, aortic insufficiency. And so in order to treat that, we perform a surgery. But I wanted to ask kind of the outcome of that surgery if uh, the valve could be compromised for like future complications due to the surgery. Uh Usually, when they're trying to, to do the repair of the VSD, they do try to make sure that they can repair the aortic valve as best as possible. Sometimes, you are still left with trivial to mild aortic insufficiency, and so those patients oftentimes will still need to be followed up uh, to see if there's serial progression uh, from the prolapse of the leaflet. If you catch it early enough, the hope is that you don't have to replace the valve because then you end up having to do the serial follow-up for the degeneration of a tissue valve versus a mechanical valve. Thank you. Just wanted to kind of get y'all's thought. How do you guys approach the screening for, for aneurysms in the head now in the coarctation mm. patients? Oh, wonderful. So uh, in terms of screening uh, the CNS for Barry aneurysms, I like to give people the thought process of aortopathies and just saying that in all spectrum of aortopathy, you think that there's some sort of, of wall thinning. For people who are having higher risk, so if people are hypertensive or if people have neurologic symptoms, headaches that are out of proportion to standard um, sinus or migraine or any other type of neurologic symptoms, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and to guarantee that they will get one screening in their adulthood. That considered to be indication becomes a you will get it a, a screening for uh, a coarctation. I don't routinely screen people who have bicuspid aortic valves unless their symptoms, either neurologically speaking, sound out of proportion to things. If somebody has controlled blood pressure with a coarctation that was repaired as a neonate, there's no upper lower extremity gradient, uh, all the imaging of the aorta shows no collaterals, and they don't have headaches or neurologic symptoms, I'll give them the option of whether they get their screening in adulthood. The big question ends up being, even if you screen somebody today in 2018, how often will you need to rescreen them again in 2023, 2028, depending on if there's progression of hypertension or neurologic symptoms. So I think those are questions that are yet to be answered, and that's what I'll pose to the patient. So I'm, I'm asking this question as a surgical intensivist <clears throat> with Houston Methodist in the community. How is it, this is for all the uh, presenters too, how, because so many of the patients have had surgery when they were very small, and when we see them now as adults in the community, how is it that you know, I'm so because their physiology now depends on what type of corrective surgery they've had, how do you know how best to treat them? How do you know how best to, how do you know what, to get the history even for these patients who have had, been operated on as children maybe many states away and are now here as adults presenting with potentially non-cardiac issues that we take care of in the community? Well, I think that's a, a great question. Um, I think that often, and, and the data shows when we do surveys of adults who have had uh, congenital heart disease, that uh, about a third at least of adults in select populations can't tell you their diagnosis. 
And if you, and then unfortunately, another third uh, have the wrong information about their diagnosis. So they may tell you, for instance, oh, I had this surgery in childhood for a hole in my heart or a valve problem, and it turns out they had total anomalous veins above the diaphragm. So often you have to be a bit of a detective. So if they've maintained care with an ACHD center, I mean, the, the first most important thing for any patient and any provider to do is contact the patient's adult congenital heart disease group and say, we've got your patient here in the ER, the ICU, um, what do you know, what can you tell us about them? And that's usually helpful, but many patients aren't ongoing care, and then sometimes we're, we're stuck with um, doing a little detective work and then re-imaging with and getting involved early, um, the adult congenital heart disease specialist in your center. So I don't know what you guys... Uh... Yeah, I'd answer that in two words. I would just ask mom. <laughs> so all these patients have a mom, I mean, I mean it, all these patients have a mom somewhere, usually, and or the wife, but ask mom, because mom will know, oh yeah, he had surgery when he was five, and can tell you where, and if that, like, that narrows down a lot, because then you could focus, okay, what hospital, what, maybe even what surgeon, but, but Dr. Phillips is right, we are really good, because I think we have to be at record getting. So if you can get us 12 hours, 24 hours, even in the ICU, which I know it's a long time, but that might allow us to get some records to say, okay, what's what. But, but you're right, you have to be, especially in the ICU, you have to work at a place where, where people know what they're looking at image-wise and, and test-wise, but then also hopefully you can have access to, like here, to an adult congenital person who can ex just explain the anatomy and maybe what happened and where the plumbing goes. And for those cases where you don't get that information or it's very challenging to hunt it down, sometimes those physical exams, as we go back to that, plus imaging can help you p put the pieces back together and look to see what types of lesions were put in through a lateral thoracotomy versus a median sternotomy, and then trying to correlate that with the imaging and the physiology that you see in front of you. And uh, so now if they're, they're actually in, in, in deference to technology, there are some questions appearing before you on the screen that... Uh, we will try and address um, uh, as we have time. Okay, are there any predictors of which patients with some degree of pulmonary hypertension will respond to shunt closure? Well, I, that's a great question, and I think that we should be thinking of all the tools in the toolbox when we have an adult present with a little bit of a high pulmonary vascular resistance, but not so high that we think it's uh, counterproductive to closure. And I, I do think that th we should do things uh, in the lab provocatively when we're evaluating these patients and whether that's a nitric oxide challenge to see how reactive the pulmonary bed is. That can uh, help you a little bit. If you've had a patient that's been on uh, vasodilator therapy, um, kind of re reassessing how their pulmonary vascular resistance is behaving, how their shunt is behaving. And then you can also, with ASDs, if you have some concern, it's not the perfect, but you could try to balloon occlude the defect in the lab and see how the right heart mechanics uh, are. So none of these things are perfect, and you would not have any one test that said, oh, if this goes well, I'm going to close, or if this doesn't go well, I think you have to take the totality of What's the patient's functional capacity? Do they desaturate? With ASDs, one of the most important tests is actually how they walk and what their oxygen saturation is. If, if you don't desaturate with walking, you're probably not popping off uh, blood flow right to left. So, so some of those things are really helpful as you integrate all the data from the cath lab and from the clinic. Um, what do you guys think in your... Agreed. <laughs> well said. Um, so next question, what is the best approach to closing a post-MI VSD, surgical or percutaneous? Caveat, that's not a congenital question, <laughs> but we'll answer it anyway. Who wants to take that one? Uh, I'll Unfortunately, take it. Unfortunately, Simran's gone. So. Yeah, I'll take it because I don't think there's a good answer. I think the answer is there, it's bad. It's both bad. It's a risk factor for death, as you know. Uh, but surgeons tell me it's like operating on wet tissue paper which is pretty bad, I would imagine. But I've seen both approaches, sur surgical or percutaneous. I think both people, operators, would tell you their version is better. I don't know if there's been one that has been determined to be better. Yeah, no, I, I kind of, that's been my experience too. It seems like the percutaneous option, you, you think it would be optimal because it exposes a patient to, uh, somebody who's already very sick to decreased risk. The problem is, if you ask surgeons how they fix these VSDs, they put an enormous patch over almost the entire septum because the perinfarct tissue is like wet cardboard. The sutures pull right through. 
if you think of the way these devices work, they're kind of right around the defect. And so it would make sense to me they might pull through. But yeah. I, mm -hmm. so I guess we don't really know the right answer. And people do whatever they think is best in the clinical scenario that presents. All right, what else we got here? Is cardiac MRI becoming the new gold standard for imaging? Depends who you ask. <laughs> But I would, I would say yes. I, I think it's, it's a very important tool, especially with last year's uh, 2017 guidelines for pacemakers and defibrillators that uh, we have a lot more utility with MRIs. I think it's getting there. That being said, you have to be in a center that can read it well and perform it well. It is a little bit more time consuming and it requires a little bit more technical expertise. So that may be the rate limiting step, that ultrasound relatively expensive and inexpensive and available almost everywhere. I think that is still going to be your front line. But just, just to counter that, and I, I'd read Echo, not MRI, I mean, the, the images that the MRI guys get are amazing, guys and gals get, are amazing. Um, and for a lot of our patients, who most of them had multiple operations before, they may be different body habitus, like big Texas-sized body habitus, that uh, MRI is, is clearly, clearly better than Echo. All right, uh, next question. What determines recurrent left-sided membranes? I'm assuming uh, that, that what you're asking is, are there clinical predictors of, of left-sided membrane recurrence, for whoever, whoever might have asked that? Um, so I guess maybe, maybe go, go approach the question from that point of view. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, if you don't, if the surgeon, and most of these are surgical, don't get all the material out, like certainly um, subaortic stenosis we see recurs, and the surgeon has to make sure they get all the abnormal membrane out the first time. But I think the same would be said for the, even the mitral valve membranes as well. Next question, for those with coarctaceous status post-stent placement in childhood, I think the question is, if you get stented in childhood and you get recoarct at that site, what do you do? Uh, you have your options. Uh, uh, if you have a uh, very good interventionalist, they can go back on up there. Uh, we have covered stents that can re-intervene both proximally or distally to the, to the stent. Uh, your other options, if you don't have that available or you're uh, limited, then you still have the surgical options available as well. So oftentimes, the, so much of it that's happening in a center is a multidisciplinary team between surgeons and interventionalists. The surgeons are becoming more minimally invasive, and the cath docs are helping alongside. Next, patient selection for stent versus surgical repair of coarctation of the aorta. Surveillance post stent, so that's kind of two separate questions there. I think one of the questions is how much of, of artifact is there going to be from the stent if you're going to be trying an MRI? A lot of times you'll want to know what the material was. The higher the ferromagnetic density, you're going to get a little bit of artifact in the, particularly the area where that stent is sitting, which happens to be where you're looking for stenosis and aneurysm. Therefore, sometimes the CT angiogram may be the more helpful one in that. It's a faster test, although it does come with the cost of radiation. So uh, I think that's how I would uh, kind of counsel it. I'd try to figure out what the stent material is and then uh, send word to my MRI team and my interventionalist to uh, appropriately assess. So I think um, we may actually stop the question answers right there. And